old cord is not quickly broken. We're going to continue on this morning in our series on the fundamentals. The fundamentals of Christianity. If you're a Christian, if you follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, can I share with you this morning that there are some fundamentals that are going to help you in your walk with the Lord. Can I tell you this morning that, that life is a battle? Can I tell you sometimes life is a war? Sometimes life is a struggle. That's just something that we have to get used to. And we've got these Christians out there that, that think that once you come to Jesus Christ, that the struggle is over. That once you come to Jesus Christ, you never have another problem again. But they couldn't be any further from the truth. I want to tell you, if you're going to serve God, if you're going to walk with Jesus Christ, you're going to have struggles in this life. There's an enemy that wants to destroy you. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, we have the victory. Amen. But there's things that God does for us. There's things that he gives us that we can use to ensure that we have the victory. It's like this. If you're in a battle, but you don't pick up a sword, the, you're not going to do very well in the battle. If you're in a battle and you don't pick up the, the utensils and the, the weapons of warfare to do battle, it's not going to do you very good. It's the same way in Christianity. If you don't do the things that God has called you to do, that God has commanded you to do to be victorious, I've got news for you this morning. You're not going to be victorious. But this morning we're looking at the fundamentals of Christianity. We've talked about two already. The scripture I just read that says that a threefold cord is not easily broken. I want to tell you this this morning unequivocally. If you will practice these three things in your life, if you will make them a part of your life, you will be victorious. You will be an overcomer. The world will, the world will take shots at you. But it will not put you down. It will not keep you down. You will rise again because the God who dwells in you is the same God that caused Jesus Christ to rise from the dead. You've got to understand the same God that was in Jesus is the same God that is in you this morning. And that's good. Ah, Let's review just a little bit. First fundamental. If you're going to follow Jesus... You've got to know this word. You need to study it. This is your promise book. This is your operation manual right here. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life to those who find them. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you will live this word, if you will meditate this word, if you will take this word in, it will give you life. The next thing that you should do as a Christian is this. Be a part of other believers. Be a part of a church. The writer of Hebrews said, Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Here's what the Bible teaches. We need each other. That's what the Bible teaches. I need you. And you need me. See, together, we're complete. The picture that we have in the Bible is a picture of a body. And different parts of your body have different functions. But it all functions together for a purpose. Guess what? There might be, there, there's something that I'm good at that maybe you're not. And there's something that you're good at that I'm not. And if we put all our talents and abilities together for the kingdom of God, then God's kingdom is increased and the glory of God goes forth. Can I tell you this this morning? God saved you to use you. He saved you to use you. God has given you special abilities and talents that only you have. And God created you to use those special abilities and talents for his glory. And you need to be part of a church to do that. Amen. The last part of this threefold cord that we're going to talk about this morning is prayer. Is prayer. Uh, remember the uh, 
power principle that we said. That God does not command you or tell you to do something that is not in your best interest. You understand that? When God says, this is what the Lord says, when God says, this is what you should do, it's not to harm you. It's not to, to give you a list of rules and regulations, but it's this. If you will follow God, if you will do what he says, that will benefit you. See, God loves you. God desires you. Can I tell you this morning that God wants the very best for you. He wants you to have life and life more abundantly, and that life is in Jesus Christ, his son. And if we will look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, we can live in this abundant life. I want to tell you, God is not in heaven looking down on you trying to beat you up every which way there is but God wants you to have a good life God wants you to have an abundant life God doesn't tell you to do something that does not benefit you so if God says go to church if God says open up your Bible read and study it if God says pray it's be hey can I tell you something it doesn't help God when you pray it's not like God's greater because you pray God's great already Prayer helps you. Prayer's for you. It's not for God. Pray. So let's talk about prayer for a little bit. Is that all right? Would you please stand one more time for the reading of our text? James chapter 5, verse 13. James chapter 5, verse 13 through 18. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will rise, raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning. Father, we want to thank you for the privilege of prayer this morning. We thank you, O oh God, that we can connect to you through prayer. And Father, it is my prayer this morning that when we leave this place, that we would have a greater understanding, that we would understand the blessings and the greatness and the privilege that we have in prayer. And Father, when we leave this place this morning, that we would understand the tremendous power that you have given us through prayer. Oh God, we love you this morning. And we pray this morning as the disciples did. Oh God, teach us to pray. Amen. You may be seated. Let's look at this glorious thing this morning called prayer. Think about this this morning. Prayer is the means by which a mere mortal man or woman can move the hand of Almighty God. Can I say that again? Prayer is the means by which a mere mortal man or woman, somebody who is subject to death, can move the hand of the almighty God. That's heavy. I mean, that really is heavy. Through your prayers, God moves. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Ah, prayer. What is it? You know, first of all, there's different types of prayer. And the, the, the truth is that, that we can't even cover them all this morning. You could write 
multiple novels upon novels on prayer. That's how exhaustive the subject is. We're not going to do that this morning. We're just going to touch on, on a few. We're just going to break pr prayer down to, the, to, to its basic ingredient. And it's this. Communion with God. Communion with God. Take it a little bit further. Communicating with God. That's what prayer is. Communicating with God. Prayer should never just be a monologue. Prayer is not just you talking to God. But prayer is also God speaking to you in your heart. Prayer is a, a two-way thing. It should always be a dialogue. Prayer is not like we go to God and he's this cosmic Santa Claus and, and we just give him a list of things that we want to, to please ourselves. But prayer is getting into the very presence of God. Prayer is, is, is hearing God and understanding God and, and seeing what God wants to do and, and lifting up your needs to God. Oh, prayer is the most marvelous thing that there is because through prayer you can come into the presence of Almighty God. Through prayer, the Bible says that you can go boldly into the throne of his grace, that you can go boldly into his throne room oh there's nothing like prayer can I tell you that prayer will change you that prayer will change people around you that prayer will change the world in which you live in prayer is so awesome it cries out to God and God responds and God moves on behalf of those cries prayer is good he said rejoice always pray Without ceasing. How do you do that? Does that mean that you have to stand on your knees for 12 hours a day? No. But it means you continually have an attitude of communication with God. When you go to work in the morning, when you go out throughout your day, your community ha you, you continually have this, this attitude of an open heart where God can speak to you. And if something comes up during the day, you can speak to God. Listen to me. Prayer doesn't have to be formal. Prayer doesn't have to be this, this that the, the, you've got to get these special clothes on and you've got to get a special rug and, and you've got to bow down so many times. No, no, no. Prayer is communicating with God and you can do that anywhere. You can do that during a walk, during a drive. It doesn't matter. Can I tell you that God wants you to pray. God wants you to communicate with him. God wants you to talk to him. God wants you to trust him. God wants you to put your burdens and your cares and roll them over on him. I tell you, God is longing for you to pray not because he not because he wants to test you but because he wants to give you himself he wants to pour himself into you and he does that through prayer that's what prayer is talking and communicating with God just like you do with your husband just like you do with your children you can do that with God he's there for you he wants you to talk to him he wants you to communicate with him Always have a mindset of communication with God. Prayer is access to the provision of God. Look at verse, look at verse 13 in your text. Is anyone among you suffering? What's the answer there? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. That's prayer too. That's communicating with God. Listen, is anyone among you sick? What should he do? Call for the elders of the church and let them do what? Pray. And what happens? Huh? Come on, speak up. They'll be healed. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed what? Sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses one to another and do what? Pray for one another that you may be healed. Do you see how God has, has given you the provisions for life in prayer? That God has given you the answer to your suffering. Pray. God has given you the answer to your sickness. Pray. God has given you the answer to the forgiveness of your sins. Pray. Do you see that, that the answers to life are here in prayer? 
And maybe one of the reasons that we walk around so downtrodden, maybe one of the reasons that we walk around so beat up by the world and we don't have any joy and we don't have any peace and we don't, we, and we don't have any happiness, maybe it's because we don't pray. Maybe it's because we don't reach up to God and get God's provision for our life. He says if you're suffering, just pray. If you're sick, pray. If you've sinned, pray. I want to tell you God is there and he's ready to meet your need. He's ready to heal your body. He's ready to forgive your sin. He's ready to ease your suffering. That's what the Bible teaches. Oh, can I tell you this morning, everything you need is in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what you've been through. Jesus Christ is the answer. He will set you free. He will make you a new person. He will give you a new life. Can I tell somebody this morning, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter all the bad things you've done. It doesn't matter how evil you've been. Jesus Christ can wash away your sins in his blood. He can make you a new creation in Christ Jesus. I want to tell you, you don't have to leave this place the same way that you came. It's there. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus died to alleviate your suffering, to heal your sickness, to forgive your sins. Amen. Can I tell you this morning? You ever do this when the Lord just gives you something? And you kind of got to go like that. Well, for me, don't laugh. That happens in the shower a lot. I get stuff from God. I, you can, I can't tell you how many sermons I got in the shower. And I'm thinking maybe I just need to start taking five, six showers a day so I can hear from God. I don't know what it is. Maybe that's holy water in our house. I have no idea. But I'm, you think I'm joking. I'm not. I'll step in that shower and just kind of start praising and praying, and pretty soon things start coming to my mind. And I'm like, oh, okay. And here's what the Lord, sh the Lord gave to me. I was, I was just, you know, getting ready for my morning stuff. And I was thinking about this message and thinking about prayer. And, he, and, and the Holy Spirit spoke into my heart. He said, there... Do you know that there's no forgiveness, that there's not any forgiveness without prayer? I had to, you know, take a step back or two. I said, well, you know, Lord, we're, we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. So what do you mean that there's not any forgiveness without prayer? He said, that's absolutely true. You are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But let me ask you this morning. Who did Jesus die for? Who did he die for? Everybody. For God, loved, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So Jesus died for everybody. But here's the reality. Not everybody receives that. Not everybody is going to go to heaven. Right? I mean, the Bible tells us many are called. Few are chosen. So what's the difference between those people and us? Prayer. Let me, let me show you. Because this is how God showed me. He said, what happened the day that you were converted and you gave your life to me? What did you do? <laughs> said, I prayed. <laughs> I knelt down at that old card table with tears streaming down my face. I said, God, forgive me of my sins. I believe in Jesus Christ and I give you my life. And what happened? He forgave me of my sins. Made me a new creation in Christ Jesus. Are we made, are, is it coming clear now? Because you, you have to communicate with God. Think about this. And I said, well, okay, you know, I, I've got that, Lord. But can you give me something else? Because by two or three witnesses, let every fact be established. Can you give me something else? He said, sure. He said, John 1, 9, 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you. What is confessing your sins? It's prayer to God. Just think about this. Everything that we get from God, right, is by faith. 
The Bible says that, 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 that those who come to him must what? Believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When you go to God, do you go in faith? If you're praying, you do. I mean, God, help me. Prayer is the key to receiving from God. Prayer is the key to, to receiving salvation. Prayer is the key to receiving healing. The, the, prayer is the key to, to alleviate your suffering. Prayer is the key. He said that. Pray. If you're going through these things, pray. Now, here's the thing. How often does this happen? When we go through the valley of the shadow of death, when everything around us is spinning out of control, when we don't understand why life is, 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 is putting this on us and we don't understand why things happen the way they do, we have a tendency to shut down. We have a tendency to block God out. We have a tendency just to go do our own thing and, and, and waller in our own mess. We do the exact thing that God tells us not to. He said, if you're hurting, pray. If you're burdened, pray. He said, cast all your care upon me because I care about you. Wow. Prayer is not just for the super spiritual. Look at verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Now, this verse has special meaning, I believe. I don't think I really got it until I started studying it out this week. Let me, can I tell you a little story about Elijah? Let me give just a, a short biography about this, this prophet named Elijah. Elijah was a prophet of God. He was a prophet in the land of Israel. And at this time, the land of Israel was, they had a king named Ahab, and they had a queen named Jezebel. Have you ever heard that name before? That's an infamous name. She has the distinction of being the most wicked, evil woman in the Bible. How would you like to have that? Huh? No. And she worshipped these prophets of Baal, who was a demonic, was just a demon. That's what he was. They would do child sacrifices. They would do all kinds of, of, of wild things. And, and, and the land was given over to that. The Israelites were worshipping Baal. And Elijah was proclaiming the true God. Now let me tell you a little bit about Elijah, how, how awesome God used him. There's a famine in the land because it's not raining for how many years? Three and a half. Can you, ima think of, can you imagine that if Arkansas didn't get any rain for three and a half years? It'd be devastating. That's how this land was. God sends Elijah to this widow. Everybody's starving. He comes in, he says, you got anything to eat? She says, well, I've got a little oil and I've got a little flour. And what I was going to do was, I'm just going to make this up and me and my son are going to eat and then we're going to die. I mean, good outlook on life. Huh? That's my plan. He, she, he goes, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you do this? Why don't you go ahead and make me something first? Huh? And she does. And the Bible says that, that every day, that flour and that oil would not run out. And it was for like, I can't even remember how many days or maybe it was even months. It didn't run out. So Elijah's got some power with God. I mean, I'm looking at Elijah and I'm thinking, wow, that's a, that's a spiritual guy. Huh? This widow, her son dies. Elijah goes up into the room and, and starts praying over him and guess what God does? Raises him from the dead. Wow. Wow, Elijah's pretty hot stuff. And then Elijah gives a challenge to the prophets of Baal. He says, I'll tell you what, fellas. Why don't you come on out here? Let's have a duel. Here's what we'll do. You build yourself an altar to Baal. There's, there's 450 of you. You build yourself an a, a, a altar to Baal. And I'll build an altar to the Lord my God. To the God of Israel. And here's, what, here's the test. 
You put a sacrifice on your altar, I'll put a sacrifice on my altar. And the one that fire comes down out of heaven and consumes, well, that's who's God. So these prophets of Baal, they, they, uh, they get out there and they, they build their altar and they, they start doing wild dances and, and, they, uh, and then they start, uh, he, he doesn't do anything. Elijah starts mocking them, you know, hey, you know, maybe he's going to the bathroom and he just doesn't, he's too busy right now. You know, or, or they start getting a little louder. He says, hey, maybe you're just not loud. Maybe he's deaf. Maybe, maybe your God's deaf. And then they start, then they start cutting themselves. Oh, that's it. I'll just get off on that. Yeah, cutting is bad. It's demonic. It's not new. It is not new. It's been going on for ages. And they started cutting themselves, hoping that their God would hear them. And nothing happened all afternoon. So Elijah puts on his sacrifice. He cuts a ditch around his altar. Then he, then he pours water over his sacrifice. And then he prays to the Lord, his God. And fire rains down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice. And then he's feeling pretty spry, so he just says, why don't we take these prophets and just kill them? And they did. They didn't mess around with sin in those days. And then... I mean, I'm thinking Elijah, super spiritual guy. And then Queen Jezebel says, Elijah, by this time tomorrow, if you're not, the, if you're not in the same place those prophets are, uh, I'm in trouble. She said, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. And he runs away scared. He goes to a lonely place. And you know what he says? God, would you just take my life? I want to die. I mean, think of, man, saw somebody raised from the dead, saw the, the widow, the, the widow given food for, so for, during a drought, saw the fire come down from heaven, and he gets to a place that, that he's depressed, and he wants God to take his life. He doesn't want to live anymore. See, that's what, I like that one. Elijah, who has a nature just like ours. You know what? God knows that we're not always going to be up on the mountaintop. God knows that there's lows in our life. God knows that there's problems in our life. God knows that there's some days that we just don't want to go on. God knows this, but God is still there. God says you can still pray, and even though you might not be super spiritual, maybe you're not walking on cloud nine, and maybe your faith isn't up here, but if you'll just reach out just a little bit, I want to tell you, I will take you, and I will raise you up. And don't I, I know that you're weak. I know that you've got issues, but but if you'll just cry out to me, it doesn't matter in what situation you're in. I will raise you up because I am your God and I love you. So it doesn't matter what I'm going through. I can cry out to God and I know he'll hear me. I know he'll raise me. That's what his word says. I don't have to have this mentality. I've got to be on the mountaintop. I've got to have all the answers. If I ever get down, God doesn't hear me. That's not what he says. If you're down, God hears you. He said, if you're, he said, a, 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 a bruised reed, he will not, he will not break. He's tender and merciful. And if you'll cry out to him, he'll hear you. Elijah. Let me tell you a story about prayer. This is one of my favorite. Anybody ever heard of D.L. Moody? He was a powerful preacher. Thousands upon thousands, probably 10,000 upon 10,000 came to the Lord under his ministry and his revivals. He was an American preacher around Chicago. And on a trip to London, England, he thought that he probably wouldn't preach anywhere because nobody knew who he was. And he was asked to preach at this church. It was a morning service. He preached and nothing extraordinarily, extraordinary happened. It was kind of a, as he put it, it was like a, it was a dead service. And this lady went home. She lived with her sister. Now her sister was an invalid and she couldn't go to church. And her sister told her who was at church today, D.L. Moody was at church today. And when she heard that, she got on her knees and she prayed all afternoon because he said, I'll be preaching here tonight. She prayed all afternoon that God would do a marvelous thing. And that night, God showed up. And dozens of dozens of people gave their life to the Lord. 
Then he went on to a, another place in Ireland, and they called him back to that church because the community was in an uproar, and they wanted to have a series of meetings. Now, here's the thing. For months, listen to this. For months, this invalid woman prayed that D.L. Moody would come to her church and preach. She didn't even know the man. She just read about him. One invalid, invalid lady who couldn't go to church prayed that this man would come to England, London, and preach in her church. And he did. That's God. That's God. That's the power of prayer. Listen, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Now, you might be saying, Pastor, that says the power of a righteous person. I'm not very righteous. I've got to stop you for just a minute right there. Yes, you are. Because here's what happens. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says that you are in sin, that you are unrighteous. But here's what happens. Jesus Christ died for your sins. And here's what happens. He takes your sin and he gives you his righteousness. So now I'm righteous not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. See, I'm a righteous person. You're a righteous person. Not because you're perfect. Not because you don't make mistakes. But because Jesus Christ died for you and wiped away your sins. And when God looks at you, he looks at the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why any time, day or night, you have the right to go into the presence of God and pray. You have access to God because of what Jesus Christ has done. You are righteous. Not by your works, but by Jesus. That's good news. Prayer. You have to do it. You have to do it. If I can say anything, Pastor, what, do you, what, what would you say about prayer? What's, your, what's, the, what's the most secretive or, or greatest principle that you could give me for prayer? What is it, Pastor? Do it. Do it. Pray. Pray to God. Pray when you're down. Pray when you're up. Talk to God. Give Him your burdens. Be honest with God. That's my advice to you. If you don't pray, start. If you pray, pray more. Just pray. It's wonderful. It's glorious. Prayer is amazing. Pray. Your answer is in prayer. Here's what we do, though. We go through something. We try to find answers everywhere else but in prayer with God. Instead of going to the first place we need to, and that is in prayer with God. Amen. Tell you what. This pastor talks a little bit about prayer. He says it better than I could, so I'm going to let him do it for just a few minutes. And I want you to listen to this. And, and listen. And if you are you awake, praise God. And listen to what he has to say. All right? Um, the last two weeks, here's where I've been. I was basically in London for like nine days, and then I was in Orlando for two days. And here's what I learned. I learned a lot about prayer, and the whole time on the trip, I was praying, God, teach me about prayer. I'm getting ready for this series, Pray Like Jesus. Let me learn about prayer. And, and I saw a lot, and it really helped me. I'll give you a few stories, and I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about, because I think God weaves into our life experience whatever we're studying in Scripture, and He brings those together. Before I left, I did one thing I've never done, going on this long preaching tour, multiple preachings every day, upwards of 5,000 people in stadiums, tons of pressure. Before I left, I posted on my blog asking people to pray for me. And I never do this because I'm the prayer, not the prayee. I'm always the person, oh, can I pray for you? Yes, I'd love to. They're like, can I pray for you? Like, no, I'm fine. I'm proud and self-righteous and independent and worthless. So no, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm one of those guys, I like to pray for people and I struggle to have people pray for me. But I finally put it online because when I travel, I have tons of physical problems. First of all, I have major, I sometimes I have inner ear equilibrium disorientation. It's been, I get off the plane and I'm dizzy and I'm seasick and I'm disoriented. I have a hard time sometimes. And I've been diagnosed with what they call Melde de Barkman syndrome. Okay? And uh, I did research on it and it is predominantly among menopausal middle-aged women who went on a cruise. 
was not the diagnosis I was hoping for. I was hoping it would say, you were so masculine with so much testosterone that your body can't handle it all in, in one form, and so your body gets disoriented from all the manness. No. <laughs> Menopausal women on cruise ships and me. That, that's what I've got. It's awesome. Um, and I also have, a, a doctor said, a deviated septum in my nose, a bone that's out of place so I don't have good breathing. And I've had chronic, low-lying, basically nasal infections my whole life. They want to do surgery. I've got scar tissue underneath. And so when I travel, if I get sick or anything, it immediately goes to my sinuses, and I'm clogged up, and I have trouble. So I prayed. And you know what? I just put it out there, and I said, I need people to pray for me. And I got tons of emails back. You know what? People prayed for me. I slept on the plane well, which is a miracle, right? I mean, have you ever been on a plane? Wow. I mean, there's no, I mean, all the people who've flown on a plane, there's never been one guy who got off the plane, looked at the flight attendant and said, where do I get one of those chairs? You know? <laughs> That's never happened. Um, I slept on the plane, eight-hour time difference, get to London, slept like a baby, no jet lag. I didn't get sick. I didn't get dizzy. I didn't get a sinus infection. Nothing. I'm totally fine. God answered that prayer. The whole time I'm there, I'm praying, God, teach me, teach me, teach me. I met pastors from, I mean, there was pastors at one conference from 52 nations, movement leaders from Dubai and Africa and England and Australia and Ireland and Scotland and Holland and all over the place. And I learned a ton. I learned a ton. It was absolutely wonderful. I, I prayed that God would let me serve them well to teach them and preach. And I felt like God answered that prayer. And I had a good last session where I felt like I had a word from God for those people and it was wonderful, and I got to serve them. And coming off the stage, I, uh, I saw a young woman about 18, 19, something like that, bro, uh, brunette, off to the side. And, you know, there's 5,000 people, and they're trying to bring me back for a, a media interview. And I looked at my host, and I said, I need to go talk to that girl. He said, why? I said, well, as I got off the stage, I saw her, and I prayed in my mind, Jesus, is there anything you want me to do for her? And he told me she was raped, and I need to pray for her. So I just walked up to this girl and I said, hi, my name's Mark and Jesus told me you were raped and I need to pray for you. She just started crying and she said, that's true. Would you pray for me? So I prayed for her and I talked to her and gave her some counsel and church and pastor and follow up. I thought, how amazing is it that in the sea of 5,000 people, there's a teenage girl, college age girl, maybe I don't know how old she was, raped. Nobody knows, but Jesus knows. And she really wants to be prayed for. But she's ashamed and embarrassed. She won't say anything. So Jesus would tell me so that I could pray for her and that she would know that Jesus loved her and he was there to help her. It's amazing that God would talk to us and that we could pray for people. I mean, that's amazing that we could participate in what God is doing. I got to be in a prayer meeting with 5,000 charismatics which is a prayer meeting on Red Bull. It's awesome. <laughs> and it really got me thinking that we need to grow as a church in prayer. We've got a lot to learn in prayer, and I'm working it out with the elders, and there will be some changes forthcoming. But people were singing, dancing, shouting, praying for the nation, sending out church planners, and I saw this huge conga line. I never seen a conga line in a worship service. I was like, hey, what's up with the conga line? And they said, oh, that's to bring forward your tithes and offerings. Really? I have never seen a conga line for the offering. Those are cheerful givers. And they raised a few million dollars for church planting. That's cool. They're, they're shouting, they're celebrating, they're praising God. And I, I was totally moved. 52 nations and Pastor Scott, who was with me, <laughs> fell asleep. <laughs> totally Mars hilled it. I was like, what the heck? Um, so we have growth in prayer, obviously. Uh, what was encouraging as well, everywhere I went, I met podcasters and vodcasters from all the nations of the earth. We did one little party in London, pod, about 300 podcasters showed up, people in London who just listened online, and they came up one after the other, and they asked, how's Grace, my wife, and then they named every one of my five kids, and I said, I just kept asking people, you're in Australia, you're in Dubai, you're in Africa, you're in, you know, London, you're in uh, Scotland, you're in Ireland, you're in Holland, like, how do you know how old my kids are? And they said, we pray for them every day. We pray for Marcel every day. The nations of the earth. I was totally 
humbled and encouraged. I, and I had people asking, because the Bellevue campus launched while I was gone, I had people come up saying, well, how did the Bellevue campus launch go on Sunday? I was like, what? They said, well, we've been praying. How did it go? And they all wanted a report from all the nations of the earth. I said, it went well. We had over 1,000. Praise God. The weirdest guy was this really tall Korean guy with a major Scottish accent. <laughs> this totally freaked me out. He came up. He's like, so how are the campuses? I'm like, dude, you're, you're a huge Korean guy speaking with like a, and not even, uh, not even Scottish. He's from Glasgow. So he had kind of a, a really major, I've been to Glasgow, major Glasgow broke. And he, he, he'd been praying for our campuses, want to know how everything was going. The, the Korean guy with the Scottish accent is interceding for our Bellevue campus. Go figure. You know, uh, people are praying for us. It was amazing. Got back to the States, flew back to Orlando, got a few days. Prayers were answered as well. I got to go to Spurgeon's Pastors College and see his private collection, which was, he's a hero of mine outside of the Bible. Met some great guys, learned a ton. Flew back to the States and uh, I got to hang out with one of my favorite authors, J.I. Packer. Wayne Grudem, got to meet R.C. Sproul and Jerry Bridges for a couple days at uh, Crossway Publishers' 70th anniversary. It was a total blessing to be there, and I learned a lot. I got a couple hours with J.I. Packer, one of the greatest Christian theologians of our day. And then on the way back, we went to the airport, Pastor Scott and I, and we were flying home, and as I was going through the checkpoint, there was another woman next to me, and I could tell she was in bad shape, earplugs in. She was wearing pajama, sort of sweats. Um, she was having a very hard time moving. She wasn't that old, late 30s, early 40s. She fell over. She dropped her bag. She was very disoriented. I didn't know what was wrong, so I prayed for her in my mind. I prayed, Jesus, what's up with her, and what do you need me to do? And I felt like Jesus told me. He said, serve her. I said, okay, Jesus, I'll serve her. So I walked up to her, and I said, hi, my name is Mark. I'm going to carry your bags. I'm going to help you to the plane. Hold my arm. I'll escort you. I said, where are you at? She said, I'm at gate 13, 11. I said, I'm in gate 13. I'll just drop you off and go to my gate. God put us together. I didn't tell her. I said, you know, we're right next to one another. So I'm escorting her, and she's having a hard time going. And Pastor Scott had gone ahead of me, got a coffee, and then came back, and he goes around the corner, and I got a woman, you know? <laughs> he's like, he's looking at me. He's like, where'd you get the girl? I'm like, well, you know, kind of. Jesus said to, don't put it on YouTube. It's totally legit, you know? Um, and so I escorted her to the plane that I explained to Scott later, and she told me she had been in a traumatic car accident four years ago and had major neurological damage. Her depth perception was off, her balance was off, her sight, her hearing was off. All of her motor skills and functions were really just destroyed. So I helped her to the train, sat her down on the tram, took her to her gate, got her to the gate, just trying to love her, serve her, look after her. I was worried about her. And uh, at the end, she looked at me, she said, so what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor, I love Jesus, and when I saw you fall down and drop your stuff, I prayed for you and he told me to serve you. I said, has anybody prayed for you with this neurological problem because she was flying from Orlando to the West Coast for treatment? She said, no, I don't think she was a Christian. I said, would you mind if I prayed for you? I said, I don't mean to embarrass you, but could I pray for you right now in the airport? She looked at me, started crying. She said, that would be great. I would love it if you would pray for me. So I prayed for her. Prayed that God would save her soul and heal her body and pray to Jesus and ask for God's kindness on her. Okay, here's what I don't want you to get. We have to pray. Here's what I want you to get. We get to pray. I don't want you to hear, pray that so God will love you. Pray, pray because God loves you. Don't pray for people because it's your religious duty. Pray for people because it's your worshipful joy. I thank God that over the last few weeks, I got prayed for, I got to pray for people, I got to see prayer answered, I got to see God speak in such a way as to allow me to pray for others. And I just, I really want all of us to share in the joy of prayer. That Jesus has made this possible. That's what prayer is about. Touching lives for eternity. It's a privilege to pray. Not only that, but prayer changes lives. It'll change your life. It'll change the lives of people around you. Sister Kathy, would you come up here this morning? Church, if you would please stand this morning.
And this is what I would like to do for you this morning. I would like to pray for you. If you have a need this morning, if you're sick, if you're suffering, if you need your sins forgiven, whatever it is, prayer is the key to God. As Sister Kathy play, plays the piano, and you need prayer this morning, you're going through a rough time right now. God is here. God hears your cry. And God is ready to help you this morning. Don't carry this burden alone. Give it to Him. Let His loving arms reach down and touch you where you're at. These altars are open this morning for prayer.